a, a presentation and some slides. Clusters tend to be different, but they can be more or less extended. They can be uh, they can involve one or more uh, sexual specializations. But the core, the key issue is that there are linkages, there is a collaboration, and the, the benefits of linkages and collaborations can be strengthened and can provide benefits to, to, to the firms in the class. So what I'm, what I'm hinting is that uh, we need to have a, a, a given uh, degree of flexibility in defining what classes are. Classes can, be, can involve several firms or a few firms with one larger firm uh, coordinating the, the, the activities of the others, or all firms identical, or all firms national, and other, and in other cases, some foreign, some uh, local, and so on. But the, the key issue, and I, I want to get into this, this de debate that tends to be very academic and very and not very useful in my mind, is that uh, the key issues is that classes tend to be agglomeration of firms where linkages and joint actions are possible. Can be pursued. No one, no one size fits all. Clusters. This, this is a diagram that you need produced uh, a few years ago, and where, where we had lo local clusters, you know, the small scale, scale manufacturers that sell locally, that sell to a large firm that has its subsidiary country or that sell to buyers, export agents, and through them they get access to international markets. And in some cases access to international markets is, is granted through uh, their relationship with large scale firms and manufacturers. So the, the, the idea of this diagram was to signal that small producers on their own find it very hard to get access to international markets. And that clusters uh, instrumental to get to get this access, as well as linkages with buyers and larger firms. That is translated in our more modern words, value chains. So, linking up to uh, foreign global markets beyond the national boundary would help firms to get access to these markets. And this is only one side of the coin. We're not talking about. Uh, market access, we're talking about, through market access, we're talking about knowledge acquisition, knowledge flows, getting access to practices, to instruments, to recipes, to ideas that help the innovation learning process in firms. I, I guess the value of um, clusters and the role that it plays in terms of coming together and enjoying you know, all the benefits. Business plan, the, the business plan, the strategy of the cluster. 
That implies having an idea of where these firms want to go, what the vision is, what the strategy is, what their bottlenecks, their current obstacles, and how to solve this, this bottlenecks in order to, uh, to, to, to achieve the target that they are they're setting for themselves. And this is a process that needs to be very specific. We don't know whether in that case a laboratory or a, a visit to a foreign market or a new training program or inviting Walmart to collaborate with the cluster or something else is the right answer. But the, the effort is to bring to the table the different actors, uh, collectively work and try to, to, to visualize what the current obstacles are and, and, and try to find answers. And help firms, what the, the ADP usually does, help firms to uh, single out the, the most important, the most binding constraint uh, that, in, that, that, that involves uh, a collective action by the firms and try to devote resources. That can be the resources from the bank or usually resources from the firms themselves. One of the ideas of, of our class of programs is that we don't give away, we don't grant funding, we don't grant 100% funding. We usually work on a matching grant where each firm contributes to some extent and this somehow signals the commitment and the relevance of, of the initiative. So it's, it's, no, it's not a magic recipe, but it's really helping different actors to work together and uh, define what the, the best alternative is and what, what the, the way forward it is. Uh, let me add one uh, simple idea. The, the work that Danny Roderick has been doing with, uh, with uh, several colleagues uh, from Harvard, including uh, Hausmann and others, that Eddie was mentioning before, talking about uh, these search processes and this modern industrial policy is, in a way, an effort to use this, this uh, evidence at the, at the local level of different firms and different actors, uh, joining efforts and, and each eliciting information from the others, whereby the, 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 the business sector does know more than the government sector in some respect, and the government knows more in other respects, and there's the research and innovation and, 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 and universities uh, that also provide their, their efforts. So really working together and finding answers and defining, uh, making a diagnosis first and then, then setting out a vision and a strategy is, is fundamental. And it's fundamental at the local level as well as the national level. I, um, I just actually wanted to, to add to the discussion because we, have, we do work directly with um, clusters or an agglomeration of, of, uh, of firms and on organizations. And I think um, and there is intervention is spot on, uh, certainly for the region, in the sense that um, perhaps in the design of, of our program there was a, a, an assumption that the firms would be able to identify um, their issues um, and identify areas for collaboration um, and were mature enough to understand that you can collaborate and compete at the same time. Um, and we, we're actually, it's all empirical, but we, at this point, we're able to tell you unequivocally that the firms that we're working with cannot do that. But it doesn't mean that they don't have the potential to be exceptional efficient clusters. It simply means that they need assistance in getting to that point. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, as far as the, the program is concerned, there's certainly um, discussion uh, on the table about how we can perhaps encourage them to be more effective in, uh, in working with each other and identifying the possibilities for, um, for collaboration for the greater good, period. But, the, the firms don't think in that way. Uh, they're not mature enough. Even the largest ones among us don't think in that way. And so there is kind, there is a, a, a void, if you will, uh, that we need to address between understanding um, where we are and where we need to go in terms of clustering and how we make that effective leap for the region. Just a clarification. What do you want them to do that they don't do exactly? 
they they don't see the potential in collaborating around an initiative. Invariably what happens is that we would provide a facilitator who would encourage them to even discuss their business with people that they're typically are competing with in the same room. They're not even of that orientation to consider um, you know, that there might be a public good or a greater good or something that they can all benefit from. They're very insular. Can I give you an example? So you may have an, an industry where you have a number of small foods, one food. So, yeah, you have one firm that is able to penetrate an export market. Yeah, and you have the other firms small firm can produce, but they're not able on their own to be able to penetrate that market. The notion, for example, of maybe giving up your brand and collectively pro and, and producing individually, but for a, a, a singular brand, so that you're now able to produce the volume in order to penetrate that market, is anathema to their thing. They will not even consider it. They are pre they prefer to simply remain where they are, doing what they're doing, but they will not consider it. They will not consider moving beyond that. And then if you are a large firm is probably doing it to share, you know, lessons learned that that's gonna happen. I make a side example, but you can I can I can I add a sentence here that uh, what, what we try to, I mean, in justifying these kind of interventions, we talk a lot about the coordination failure. We're talking about, we talked about the idea that, uh, and this is a long story in economics. I mean, Albert Hirschman and several others started talking about, and Jose Stanford we started talking about uh, the idea that in, in, in an economy, it often happens that firms would pursue their interest, it would be perfectly rational and informed. But at the same time, in the absence of a, of a clear coordination with other actors, the, the optimal for the, for the whole society, for the whole economy, would not be achieved. And we often use the example of the tourism industry, whereby unless we plan together uh, building a road, and building a harbor, and building a hotel, and, and, and setting up an advertising strategy, and, and training the right, the right kind of uh, cook, and, uh, and and so on, you know. You, we would have isolated hotels, or we would have roads with no hotels at the end, or we wouldn't have we would have hotels with no personnel, and so on. And and sometimes the role of external actor can help facilitate this this coordination. Question: I'd like to ask the complete Caribbean lady. Was was any work put into meeting with the persons who are involved? in this cluster um, prior to the process to educate and inform them about what the benefits and opportunities are of getting into this type of framework? That is a starting point um, okay. for, it's a, it's, it's a very involved process, but that's often where we start. And that's why we can tell you, um, as I said before unequivocally, that we have to start there. There is a learning that has to take place before we, we see any um, effective activity as a result of this clustering. So, and, that, and we're learning that for, for the region, for our firms, it takes a little while longer than we had anticipated because there's a very um, intense trust, trust issue <laughs> that pervades and actually undermines to some extent okay. uh, what we're trying to do. Okay, what were some of the main um, concerns that was uh, presented during this evaluation process as to why they were so opposed to um, this type of collaboration? It happens, it's different in every case, and it depends on the dynamics of the, of the firms well, that you're working with. And I just want, um, for, just for my information, what were some of the concerns that were raised, given, given if you have any examples? In terms of why they would not want to work with each other, it was mostly that they didn't understand the opportunities that were that were there or involved with working with each other. It was just it was a learning issue for the most part. On on this issue, um, and I think the learning is a key. And then I just thought about one example of a prop walk 
Evolve, which is a sort of scheme that uh, Evolve brought quite well, uh, implemented by the Chilean government. I think they are actually, okay, they are trying to uh, create a trust and also create a sort of collaborative work, but then what they did was not to force them to, well, not force them to work together, but then, well, they offer the fund and they offer the expertise for those group of firms who come up with one problem that they want to solve. And through that, I think it's, they would be able to come up, I mean, uh, get together and solve that, and then they, they would be able to build a trust from there and then to go on to the other level of, I think, collaboration. That's exactly how it works. <laughs> My, my take is that, uh, I mean, it's, I wouldn't use the word educate firms. Because in several instances, firms know much more, certainly know much more than what I do. And, and most of us uh, do not belong to a business environment. So we, you know, we have our competencies and, and different skills and different uh, set of information. So it's really a matter of helping them coordinate. I mean, they, they would, it, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, several Caribbean islands, they would like, and I actually took part in a very amusing uh, cluster development uh, uh, work in, in Tobago, where they wanted to create the clusters of uh, small hotels and they were missing uh, cooks. So there was a cook from the Bahamas that came over to Tobago and trained the different cooks. And, and, and no small hotel alone would solve problem of, of, of training and finding and paying for a, for a good cook. But they put together the effort and the European Union was providing some grant funding and they, uh, they, they carried out this training program and that solved the problem they were all facing. Uh, they would have liked to collaborate but they didn't know how and, uh, and this, this helped uh, them solve the problem. So it's really a matter of, of my mind of, of coordination. I, I was thinking here the rule of public public policy in this it means a little bit difficult for Complete Caribbean because of its structure, but it's at a country level. It allows policymakers to find creative ways um, to direct policy to, to, to that kind of grouping as opposed to individual groups. Yes, Last um, question. Lunch, when last one. Yes. Um, just on, on, on the other side as well, too, and then you said not really using the word education, but for example, the example that you gave, um, let's say, and I, know, I don't know if people in Tobago know about it, but let's say maybe it would help um, if more persons who participated in the cluster initiative and were successful, to, if they, you could somehow engage and to demonstrate that success on a more interactive level with persons that you're trying to encourage to do that. So, for example, rather than it coming from the technician or the person who facilitates that, the persons who have participated in the process, gone through the experience, and so then engage them with the persons that, in a similar environment like this, persons who you would like to do the same thing to. Because what I've realized from um, the work that I do, nothing beats that level of experience and contact where a business person or a cluster of business persons to another business person can then say, listen, I've been through it. Because in their mind, the perception is, you're not a business person, you don't know, you don't, you don't, you don't lose profits, you don't experience this. But a business person can talk on that level and then they would appreciate knowledge. No, that's very true. Thank you. Thank you for this comment. As a matter of fact, one of the specific instruments that these programs use is this visits to see what happened in other firms and other clusters around the world. And we learn from other pairs, from other businessmen and women who've been uh, going through the same process. And then today we have innovation, innovation systems. How, how does it all fit together? Are we talking the same language or are we adding new new ideas and new systems and new and new and new jargon? Uh, let me try to uh, in, in this hour I'll try to give you an idea of uh, of how I see how these elements are related. And I will do it uh, in, in 
in stages by first uh, uh, looking at what clusters are, then briefly looking at what value chains are, and then how these two concepts, these two dimensions are related, and how this is all related and embedded into innovation systems. Uh, this summarizes a, a huge amount of work in, in, in consulting and research and policy advice to governments. So, um, uh, that, that is a cover of a book that we published together with, with uh, some colleagues trying to put together all these issues of classes and value chains and linking them to the innovation systems and arguing that these different strands of literature, these different approaches by themselves alone, they do not encompass the whole set of problems, the complementarities and the, the different uh, policy issues that are underlying each of them and, and we need to look at all of them at the same time because I mean, these are really theories and, and, and ex post rationalization but reality is much more complex than how, than, 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 than how we can manage to describe it and, and actually categorize in, in different taxonomies and, and, and concepts. concepts. And, and when, what focus of, of this lecture will really be the, the learning. Uh, learning is, is one side of the innovation, in my mind. Learning at the firm level is very important. Innovation, we're not talking about frontier, uh, you say, blue sky or, you know, uh, uh, very advanced innovation, producing something that is new to the world or doing it in a way that nobody has been uh, uh, using before. But innovation is really improving marginally, it's adding new dimensions, it is, is producing, producing a slightly different product with a slightly different process and incrementally adding something. Innovation can also be something that is new to the firm, not necessarily to the, the country or the world. And, and learning has an important function, plays an important function within the innovation process as it enables innovation. It enables pushing the, 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 the frontier, the firm level frontier forward and, and, and improving organization and processes and products. So I'll, 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 I'll look into this as well, and, and I think that the learning dimension is very important to understand a little bit, uh, all this. Um, it, the, I guess that, that, that this morning's discussions already touched upon some of these issues, and, and wondering why we're now talking about value chains and clusters and innovation, and, and and this is, in my mind, a reflection of the, of the current changes in, in, in reality, in, in the, 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 the global landscape, and how the industry is organized uh, worldwide, and how firms organize their activities that span different countries, and uh, innovation plays a role in, 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 in most of firms' activities. So, what, what we observe is that production ten, tends to be at the same time, globally, um, uh, geographically dispersed, fragmented in a way, and functionally integrated. So this means that different steps of the production process, different components are made in different places. So in a way, the production process is fragmented, but at the same time, it's functionally integrated. So there's someone that is uh, pulling the threads, that is leading the process, that has the the rationality behind the organization of, of, of these production processes. And this is what we are observing more and more. And we see that there are dispersion across uh, countries grows, large firms as well as buyers play a larger role worldwide. Uh, I, I, used to, I used to look at the uh, Fortune 500 list of countries a few years ago and the, the, the names that most frequently appeared on top were uh, Mobile, uh, Exxon, Shell, the big oil companies, essentially, and then Ford and Toyota, and the big manufacturing companies. If you go into the uh, Fortune 500 nowadays, you won't find these companies anymore. The largest firm in the country, in the, in the world, is now Walmart. And then among the largest are Apple computers, and Google, and I don't know how big or how much to value uh, Facebook, but totally different companies in 
including companies that do not manufacture much, but they demand, they buy a lot from, the, from other countries and from other uh, companies and organize production and organize distribution and, and sell them and organize retail chains and, and, and supply supermarkets and supply uh, intermediate producers. So the, the, the network of, of production relationships is getting more and more complex and, uh, uh, and, 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 and this reflects the emergence of what are usually called global value chains, global supply chains, or production chains, or production networks, or a number of different uh, modes of organizing production and international transactions. Well, while, while we observe that reality is changing in, 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 in this fashion, at the same time we realize that clusters, that firms, keep being agglomerated. If you look for soap production, you would probably go to two or three different places in, in the world. My own country, in the northern part, in, in, in Como, and then, and then you would go to other parts in China, and a few other places. And if you want to go and see where computers are made, you probably go to some parts of China and some, somewhere else in, in the States for some minor components. And so there's, there's still a phenomenon of, of geographical agglomeration of production that is persisting. In spite of this globalization of production, in spite of uh, the big Walmarts and, uh, buying intermediate products and services from all over the world. So this, in, in reality, even if economists and, and, and business specialists uh, propose the ideas and concepts such as clusters and then value chains and then observing foreign direct investment and so on, all these phenomena, phenomena occur at once and they are uh, interrelated and they all overlap. And, and, and perhaps the, the unifying concept that is behind all this, in my mind, is really the linkages I mentioned. The, the transa transactions and the linkages among the different actors, that can be at the local level, it can be international, it can involve the public sectors as well as the private sector, as well as knowledge producers and universities and research centers. And, and, and the different uh, government agencies promoting um, enterprise development and innovation development, and so on. So it's that there's a, a growing network of linkages among many different factors that is behind the, the economic growth and behind the development of, uh, of countries and, and, and their economies. And the, and the governance of this relationship, the coordination, and how coordination serves the purpose of of, of, of uh, promoting development in different places is, is, is crucial. So the, the reality is getting complex and complex. Let me try to focus on, on what I think within this context, within this uh, world that is changing in a way whereby uh, geographical agglomeration of production coexists with uh, the organization of production along value chains and production chains and uh, the, the role of services in this, in this world that is growing. I think that the, the key concept that explains how firms can take advantage of, of, uh, of, of, of these uh, different forms of uh, industrial organization is through upgrading. Upgrading as a necessary condition for in the literature, there's, there's this uh, discussion about the high road or the low road to globalization and international competitiveness, whereby, I mean, one way of being competitive worldwide, that is something I was listening to uh, a couple of weeks ago in Mexico, where I was working, where we are working with the IDB, with the, with the government there. And, and one of the discussions we often hear is that the Mexican economy is getting more and more competitive. Then you ask them, why is it getting more competitive? And the answer is that wages are growing faster in China, our wages are not growing, and therefore we get we are more competitive. Is this a good business? <laughs> I don't think it is. I think that the real challenge is to, to grow, to improve productivity and competitiveness, as well as wages. So the, the really the, the key behind the 
you know, a, a useful and productive insertion into international markets and competitiveness is really adding innovation, introducing innovation to production processes, to services, to service uh, provision, and adding value through the innovation process. And, and different scholars have, have, have been trying to classify what upgrading is, what it means. I mean, upgrading is, is, is often a very, very generic term. So upgrading means, I mean, to our ears, it often means just you know, improvements. And I, I don't want you to uh, bring home the, the feeling that uh, upgrading is a very generic term. I mean, in our uh, terminology, upgrading is something very specific. It means applying innovation to production and service provision and uh, uh, with the aim of adding value and upgrading can take different forms. This is one possible uh, uh, categorization. When we talk of uh, 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 upgrading our processes, our products, our functions, and intersectoral upgrading. Let me explain you very briefly what, what it is. Uh, it, it is easy to explain this uh, looking at a uh, value chain. The value chain in its most simple, in its simplest form is a, a sequence of different activities. Suppose that you're producing a, a, a wooden furniture, a wooden table, and you, you would have to produce the wooden logs, then you, you would have to work them and transform them into furniture pieces, and then have the final product and sell it. This can be done by one firm, by many different firms. And these different firms can, can uh, be located in different countries. I mean, in my, in my little garden in Rome, I used to have a, a, a very nice uh, wooden table. And I, you know, there was a label saying that the wood was coming from Vietnam, it had been assembled in South Africa, and it was sold in the streets of Rome for $50. So if one really wonders where value is added, you know, considering transportation and considering all the work and the services and, and so on. But the, the different functions can be carried out by one firm or several firms. Suppose that A, B, and C are different firms. Um, product and process upgrading is something that takes place within a firm, or within a, a production uh, segment, the production stage, whereby a firm improves its products or improves its production process and, in, and improves uh, productivity and carries out a process, uh, uh, some, some uh, process upgrade. Or suppose that the firm, instead of just uh, producing the wooden logs, learns how to produce the, the whole uh, furniture, the whole table. So having additional machines, having additional skills and the skilled personnel required to do that. And instead of just selling the wooden blocks, the wooden logs, it would sell the finished furniture. It would probably get access to a larger share of the value that is being produced. This, this is something I would call a functional upgrade, getting into different business functions, different production functions, and adding to Manufacturing capacity, also design capacity, for example. Learning how, not, not just to assemble and, 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 and manufacture, but, but design different components and different products. Or even using the skills learned in, uh, along and by working in one chain and using it to a different, into a different chain, or to enter a different chain. I have a, a few examples here. Um, like, uh, for example, uh, product upgrading. When firms move into more sophisticated goods, products, they start selling goods that sell at a higher price. And, and this is often related to a different uh, uh, distribution channels. In Asia, for example, um, the, the apparel commodity chain initially started selling uh, 
uh, into uh, discount chains and then department stores where department stores sell uh, at a higher price. So they were gradually uh, upgrading their products and getting access to shops where they could sell at a higher price. Or uh, examples of process upgrading like uh, what uh, food food producers have been exper exper experiencing in uh, southern Brazil for many years, uh, where thanks to the collaboration with the, uh, the North American buyers, they managed to improve the production process. They managed to add new machines and, and improve the layout and, and better use the, the, the skills and the, the technical and engineering skills required to produce uh, shoes. So really adding and improving productivity. Or uh, functional grading when firms acquire new functions or abandon existing ones so that they can increase the overall skill content of their activities. That's an example that was made famous by, by Gary Gareffi and Jennifer Baird of uh, Torreon in Mexico, in northern Mexico. Uh, Torreon is, in Mexico is, is known as the, the capital of the blue jeans where companies like Wrangler and Levi's and, and Gap and several others uh, uh, operate. And, 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 and Mexican producers gradually learned how to uh, enter into different functions. Instead of just assembling the different uh, pieces of cloth, they started, they learned how to put them together and sell them as a package to uh, different department stores in, in the US. So appropriating part of the value that was being created elsewhere. If we have time, I have more details on this, uh, and we can see it later. And perhaps some of you already listened to this story, and listened to Gary Gareffi and, and his group in the past few months. And, and intersectional upgrading is another way of looking at uh, uh, the process of upgrading, whereby firms, by developing the competencies, the competencies uh, while operating in a value chain, they use the same competencies and venture into a different chain. In Taiwan, Taiwan in, in, in the 90s was the largest uh, producer of TV sets. And within that decade, it became the largest world producer of, of uh, uh, PC screens. Technologies are related, they are relatively near, and, and by the developing the competencies to become a very good TV set producers, they venture into the more comfortable uh, business of, uh, of uh, screen computers. And this is what they did uh, uh, over, over a short period of time with an intensive process of learning and innovation behind this. <laughs> this is a big question. I mean, if upgrading is necessary, upgrading is the is a relevant concept and is required to, to, to strengthen industrial um, uh, development and, and, and growth. How can small firms, local firms, I mean this is not only related to small firms, it's really related to all, all local firms, all developing countries firms, all Caribbean firms that want to, yesterday I was trying to catch a flight that took me here very late last night and there was uh, an HSBC uh, advertisement with a, with a little table and different lemonades. I don't know whether you see it. And, and, and this uh, ad was saying, uh, also for lemonade, there's always a global market. There was a little boy you know, squeezing lemons, and, and there's a new ad by this band that is showing how uh, global markets matter and how firms need to face themselves with, uh, with, with global markets and learn how to compete in, in these global markets. And, and in my mind, uh, two different ways of organizing production and organizing linkages with other firms and other institutions is, and, and, and get access to these upgrading processes is by working in clusters and in value. So clusters and value chains, in a way, from, from point of view of the developing countries, firms are instrumental to carry out processes of upgrading. 
and plus the value chain among the, the academics among you uh, belong to or were initially started uh, from two different strands of literature. One that was looking at the role of local linkages in generating competitive advantages in extra industries. So there was this, this phenomenon of uh, Italian and German uh, sets of small enterprises all agglomerated next to each other and, uh, um, and, 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 and linked uh, to each other and generating competitive advantages in spite of their small size. And, and then the phenomenon expanded and, and you know, looking, at, uh, looking through uh, cluster lenses, we discovered that clusters exist all over the world and that there are different degrees of agglomeration. But a, a, a literature was, was generated by the observation of, of, of this specific phenomenon of agglomeration of production activities. And global, the global value chain literature started from a very different standpoint. Started at looking how uh, multinational companies organize their activities. And, uh, and it started realizing that multinational companies set up different subsidiaries and different uh, linkages with different countries. So their activities tend to be fragmented worldwide. So the, the standpoint is very different. From the standpoint of, uh, of a CEO of a large corporation organizing its companies, his companies or her companies' activities worldwide, whereas the clusters tend to look at the, the, the phenomenon of globalization from a local standpoint. Yet, they, they will come to uh, closer uh, to, 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 to similar con concepts. Um, if I were to give a definition of clusters, I would recall two people. Pecatini, I don't know whether you've heard of him, this is an uh, Italian economist from Florence, who was president of the, the Italian Economist Association, who has been writing, following the steps of Alfred Marshall in England, was focusing very much on the idea of industrial districts. And he emphasized this, this, this idea of think, thickening of, of, of society and thickening of production systems, whereby firms and society tend to overlap and, 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 and each influences the other, and agglomeration brings about uh, uh, advantages to, to, to local firms. And, and the, the work of uh, Michael Porter, that, that is probably more famous than Legatini, has been uh, popularizing the concept of clusters, um, uh, focusing on the idea that they are a geographic concentration of competing and cooperating companies, suppliers, service providers, and other institutions. And the, the mystery behind both definitions is that there's both a process of competition and a process of collaboration. And wherever I go and talk about the Italian industrial clusters, they will tell me, well, you're Italian, you know, Italians love each other, Italians have a good uh, character, everybody loves them, and for them it's easy to collaborate. But here we don't collaborate. Barbados, collaborate, you have to collaborate. You, you like your, 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 your neighbors, you like the, you know, the, the other firms you're competing with, you're competing, you're not collaborating. I'm arguing that this is not true, that all firms try to maximize or get the, the, the most they can from, from their markets, and they only collaborate if it's convenient to them. But there are several instances where it is convenient to them to collaborate. And we'll see why. So it's not, it's not a matter of culture, a matter of you know, being different. So the others collaborate because they are Europeans, but it's not, it's not, this is not the case. <clears throat> and, and the key story is that, as other colleagues like Hubert Schmitz from Sussex and others called this phenomenon, firms localizing clusters benefit from collective efficiency. It's a nice word. It's, it's efficiency, but it's collective. So it's, it's, it's not efficiency to the disadvantage of the others. On the other hand, belonging to the same cluster helps strengthening your efficiency, improving your 
uh, productive conditions. And, uh, and firms, what's, what's the key behind that? Behind uh, uh, the, the success of these classes? There's, there's, there's two key dimensions. One is that a firms' agglomeration generate external economies. That is something that firms do not necessarily look for, but they're there. If, if, if they are agglomerated there, they can benefit from a number of externalities. And this is also the reason why public policies are justified, because externalities tend to, um, tend, tend to limit the functioning of markets, tend to introduce market failures, and call for policy intervention. But at the same time, uh, firms agglomeration opens the way to what the literature calls joint actions or collaborative actions on trying to do something together to our common benefits. Let us create brand. Let us create, uh, we, we all face the problem of, uh, you know, uh, uh, working with leather, and uh, processing leather, but we don't have the minimum size required to have a, a laboratory and explore how different colors can be used of different kinds of leather. Unless we put resources together, we'll never be able to do it. And if we do that, we will all benefit. But none of them would do it alone. Being agglomerated, you may have more opportunities to, to generate these collective actions. So there's a set of spontaneous advantages and a set of collective joint actions that can be developed, and this brings about collective efficiency. When we talk about externalities or, or external economies, what, what do I have in mind? Uh, those of you who study more economics are probably familiar with these ideas, with these concepts, like uh, um, you know, if, if, you, if you have the firms localized in the same place, you, this would itself probably generate a pool of specialized skills. I mean, if you, if you had studied, uh, I don't know, engineering for some specific uh, microchip uh, uh, products that are uh, used uh, for uh, advanced electronics, where would you go? You would go where the largest firms in the world producing and assembling electronics are located. Probably China, perhaps the, the, the western coast of, of the United States. And this creates uh, 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 pools of specialized fields where firms, if they wanted an engineer with this uh, kind of uh, features, would probably go to Silicon Valley or Taiwan or a few other places in the world. And, and, and this is an advantage. So, so firms would find the, kind, the appropriate kind of skills close to where they are, or close to, to where these clusters are. The same uh, apply, often applies to uh, the supply of specialized inputs. That's, that's an idea of uh, the information uh, and the knowledge that is relevant to a production that is uh, easily diffused within clusters. That's, of course, there's always this trade-off between you know, releasing information and knowledge and trying to keep control of innovation and, and preventing it from spilling over to others. But to some, ex to some extent, the, 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 the secrets of the trade tend to be widespread and tend to circulate more intensively where firms agglomerate rather than other, in other places. Um, improved market access, concentration attracts customers. So if a, if a big customer wants to buy specific product, would probably go where several firms produce the same thing. So that's another advantage that is that's just, that is spontaneous. It does, does, does not require any explicit effort to collaborate, but it's something that that agglomeration brings about. And in some cases, there's, there's this phenomenon called social capital. In the literature, there are many different definitions, but it's something this this you know this intangible uh, trust and, and 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 collaboration and confidence in what we do here with other firms that are neighboring and with, with whom we've been sharing markets and activities, uh, this would uh, uh, provide additional advantages. 
<clears throat> and, and, and the joint action I was talking about are different forms, and be, uh, there are different uh, taxonomies of, of, of joint actions. These are examples that come from, from different uh, projects carried out by the IDB. Sorry, this is Spanish, but these are examples uh, that, for example, have to do with uh, um, buying uh, uh, intermediate inputs together. A group of firms that decides to go and buy and bargain better terms as, as the, the, the order size is larger, or uh, reducing the, the, the cost of, uh, of trading abroad and, and uh, organizing uh, missions and visits to potential customers or trade fairs, or defining a, a norm or a standard. This, this is an example of, of uh, great producers in, in, in Colombia where they needed and they got some uh, support from the IDP to build a brand, to, to, to set a number of standards that define that what uh, Uva Isabella, what uh, Isabella Grape is, and what qualifies to be Isabella Grape, and now Isabella Grape commands uh, higher prices in the market. That was the result of a joint uh, consciously pursued uh, uh, action, and so on. Example, examples of this sort. Let me spend a couple of minutes on this issue of, of, of clusters definition and clusters mapping. I know that you've gone through, some of you have gone through a process of, of cluster mapping and an exercise to map where clusters are, are and what, what they are. Um, in general, in cl clusters need to have a critical mass of firms that tend to be specially concentrated with some degree of cycle specialization. The even bigger question, how do innovation systems affect these learning processes that may occur within value chains? It's, it's very hard to summarize this in, in, uh, in uh, a few minutes, but let me, let me try to jump to... Uh, I mean, the, the taxonomy I was uh, describing before this is the same taxonomy I was showing you with those diagrams, with those big arrows and different structures of, of the value chain is revealed here. And, and the others uh, uh, was, were explaining that the governance type, the market modular relation of capital or hierarchical model, tend to depend on these three different variables. The complexity of transactions, the codification of transactions, and the competence of suppliers how good suppliers are, whether the transaction can be codified, so I can send you a recipe, and you produce the screw that is described uh, according to those uh, internationally agreed standards or uh, standards set by the company, or the complexity of transactions, that is, when it's very hard to carry out the transaction, where you cannot simply rely on the market, go to the market and buy whatever screw that the market would, would, uh, would require. If you need a screw for an, an iPhone, you cannot buy any screw from whatever supply. You need to have that specific one that responds to those specific standards. So this has an impact on the likelihood of the emergence of the different forms of, of value chain. What do the uh, IS, the innovation systems, have to do with all this? They have to do, I think, a lot. There's, there's still a lot of, this is still work in progress, and there's not much evidence on try, uh, helping us to understand a little bit how innovation systems affect learning in value chains. But in, in, a, in a well functioning innovation system, the costs of transactions are low. The relational forms of governance are more likely so that the big firms do not have to do everything themselves. They can rely on the market to a larger extent. It's easier and less costly to carry out transactions in the market. And uh, 
and 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 this, for example, for example, was uh, uh, very effective in 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 Taiwan, where uh, the, the first value chains that uh, were developed in the country tended to be more hierarchical, large buyers and producers, from, mainly from the United States and Japan, that invested there. They tended to have very very rigid uh, uh, structures and organization, and gradually. The process of developing capabilities in local firms help these firms, and the innovation system prevailing in, in the in the in the country uh, help these firms to move from a hierarchical to a, a more relational uh, value chain that allowed some extent of functional upgrading by local producers. And 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 what we have found out. Uh, is that the, the presence of active technical bodies and technical uh, is, institutions and organizations and, and laboratories and, and public research institutions and so on, they help a lot in this process. They help to bridge and coordinate chain leaders and their local partners. They ease the exchange of, uh, of comp complementary knowledge. They reduce the complexity of transactions. So they, they actually helped make uh, the uh, value chains less hierarchical, more relational, and, and creating more room for functional upgrading by local firms. Uh, the, the, the issue of qualification of transactions is another major issue, and uh, that has to do with uh, all the uh, organizations in charge of standards and metrology in an innovation system. Provided that these uh, organizations are in place and they work uh, uh, effectively, uh, it's more likely that modular chains and relational chains uh, uh, would prevail. And I'm quoting here the work uh, that Michiko has been doing on Salmon, on Salmon, where um, uh, the uh, the, the, the organizations and specifically the, uh, the Association of Solar Industries in, in Southern Chile played a role uh, uh, helping the involvement of local firms both as value chain leaders and qualified suppliers in foreign led chains. Foreign -led, uh, chains. And, uh, and of course, I mean, this is a word of caution here because the, the Solomon uh, industry in Chile has developed in a way that neglected uh, the impact on, on, on the environment and it suffered a, a major crisis uh, two or three years ago. And, uh, and, and this crisis reminds us of the need for uh, very, very tight regulations uh, compensating environmental standards and, 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 and issues. And, uh, and of course, uh, the, the stronger the supplier's competence, uh, uh, competencies are, the easier it is to have a relational value chain, and easier it is to have a firms uh, uh, upgrading functionally and getting into more sophisticated segments of value chain. And, and therefore, you know, working with uh, and strengthening the technological capabilities of local firms would help these firms uh, gain and get better uh, benefits from interacting with, with uh, global value chain. And then there's this issue of intersectoral upgrading, learning across different value chains and acquiring competences, competences and then investing in using these competences to enter uh, into different, uh, different uh, value chains, and these are some examples that uh, prove to be effective in helping this, this learning. Uh, let me try, I mean, just one slide here to, to make a quick conclusion. Um, the, this literature is emphasizing a lot of the role of governance patterns in influencing the potential for upgrading that is open to local firms. Uh, governance patterns tend to be dynamic and do change over time, sub they're subject to changes. 
So we need to adopt a, a dynamic look when we look at value chains and uh, explore and study their governance and, and study how these chains can actually influence global firms' uh, uh, grading. The characteristics of the innovation system affect this evolution and therefore have an impact on learning uh, opportunities. I mean, it's a two-way relationship. Innovation systems help local firms uh, getting the, and exploiting the potential advantages offered by uh, global value chains, and in turn, global value chains may influence the innovation system and may help strengthen the innovation system in some cases or hinder the development of the innovation system in other ways. But it's, it's, it's a dual, uh, multi uh, social relationship. Um, of course, I mean, th these are all very complex issues. There's uh, initial data availability. It's very hard to go beyond uh, uh, case studies that are very specific to specific examples, and, and we're all trying to build uh, more data to analyze these issues and uh, look at uh, what policy instruments can be implemented in order.